<clears throat> the name of the story is 86 Death Dick Road. I had on my good pants, the uncomfortable ones, and was in the car with Lynn. I knew we were going somewhere. I didn't have any interest in going because I was wearing a tie and jacket. She had on the lemon perfume I bought her two Christmases back. When was the last time we were out on a date, she said. She wore a brightly colored shawl, paisley and gold and orange. It came to me that her hair, when I wasn't noticing, had gotten longer, the way she'd worn it back in college. Long time, I said, made the turn on 206, heading south. Twilight was giving way to a cool spring night, and we drove with the windows open. Who told you about this guy, I asked. I saw Theta in the market Wednesday. She and Joe went to see him. She said the guy's amazing. The man who knew too much, I asked? No, he's the smartest man in the world. But come on, 50 bucks to behold his brilliance, I said, and sighed through my nose. Don't be insipid, she said. You can ask him anything and he knows the answer. I can stay home and get that on the internet for free, I said. Her smile went to a straight line. Before things could get rotten, I said, how many questions do you get to ask? It was all I could think of. Everybody gets one question, she said, staring through the windshield. What are you gonna ask him? Why you're such a turd, she said. <laughs> what did Theta ask him, two plus two? She asked him if she was ever gonna have a kid. It doesn't take the smartest man in the world to answer that one, I said. She's 50 if she's a day. He told her no, but after he gave his answer, she said he got up from his throne and walked over to her table. He shook hands with Joe, and then leaning over Theta, the smartest man in the world cupped her left breast with his right hand and whispered, know this. She said she felt a spark inside her that went straight to her brain and exploded. That's what she said. She started crying, the audience clapped, the guy returned to his throne and took the next question. Know what, I asked. I don't know, said Lynn and laughed. We drove on listening to the radio, neither of us saying much, except for me wondering aloud if there was going to be any booze involved. Lynn gave a curt no and then said, okay, you have to slow down here. We have to look for a dirt road going into the trees up on the left. What's the address, I asked, easing down on the brake. She lifted a piece of paper off her lap and unfolded it quickly. Turning on the overhead light, she read, 86 Death Dick Road. Suddenly I was almost past the entrance in the trees. I slammed on the brakes. There was no other traffic behind us, so I backed up a little and made the turn. Okay, look for Death Dick, she said. Are you kidding, Death Dick, I said. I didn't see any streets, just the dirt road ahead winding through the woods, lit by my headlights. The place is called Mullion, she said. I looked over at Lynn and her hair was glowing. When I looked back at the road, we were driving up at, on asphalt through a posh suburban neighborhood of McMansions and landscaped lawns. Up ahead, I saw a lot of cars parked along the street on both sides. I guess that's it, she, I said. But which house, asked Lynn. I slowed way down and crept to the end of the car line on the right-hand curb. We got out and I joined her on the sidewalk. Lynn pointed to the front lawn two doors down at a bright tube of violet neon twisted into the name Mullions. Is this place legal, I asked. I guess so, she said. We were met at the front door by a thin woman on the downside of 60. She wasn't fooling anyone with the surgical cinching of her face. Millions to Mullions, she said. I'm Jenny. I hope you're ready for some answers tonight. She flashed us a big smile of giant teeth and held out her hand, palm up. Lynn dug through a purse and retrieved our 50. Once Jenny had it in her hand, she said, ask well, and then stepped aside as we passed into the living room. Once we were out of earshot, Lynn said, what was up with her face? It's better to ask well than look well, I said. <laughs> the living room was packed, people milling around, talking, sitting on the gold upholstered furniture. A huge bad painting of a garden with a waterfall and a McMansion in the background hung in an ornate frame in the center of the wall above the couch. The carpet was also gold and there was a small chandelier above. I looked around and right off the bat, I spotted some of my neighbors from town. I pointed out Dornsbury to Lynn and she rolled her eyes and whispered, not that douchebag. I'd never seen this guy at a party in town that he wasn't lecturing some poor bastard on the finer points of golf, a holy rolling cigar smoking run his presence was bad enough, but off to the left of us was Mrs. Krull, laying out for some old guy on the verge of either sleep or death one of her long bummer stories. When her one-legged aunt had succumbed to cancer of the vagina, she called, kept me on the phone for an hour with the excruciating details. I heard she had a pair of gray parrots on perches in her dining room that crapped willy-nilly and constantly repeated the phrase, just kill me, in her husband's voice. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn saw I'd noticed Krull and she said, sorry, this smartest man better be really smart, I said. 
Then a woman walking by carrying a plate. Uh, then a woman walked by carrying a plate with hors d'oeuvres on it. I thought I caught a glimpse of pigs in a blanket. Eats, I said. If they have anything to drink besides soda, bring me a glass, said Lynn. And I was off, wending my way through the crowd, happy to have a purpose. On the way, not really knowing where I was going, I spotted a good-looking young woman with a pile of blonde hair, holding a plate with water chestnuts wrapped in bacon. Not bad, I thought, and hoped there'd be spare ribs or maybe shrimp. I got jostled by the crowd, excusing myself a dozen times for every few feet traveled. It was the sight of someone holding a beer that gave me the fortitude to continue. <laughs> Within the sea of bodies, it got really hot, and I started to sweat. The deep rumble of conversation washed over me from all directions, snatches of dialogue differentiating themselves for a moment, and then melting back into the general hubbub. I told her, don't try it, bitch. Peter did so well on the SATs, I had to invent a new grade for him, better than A+. The dog is old, the crap's on the rug every day now. It's supposed to snow later. When it felt as if I'd been on my pigs in the blanket search for a half hour, I finally went up to a woman I vaguely recognized from the grocery store in town where she was a cashier. Hi, do you know where the food is, I asked. She shook her head, and when she did, right on the spot she turned into Dornsbury. He gave me a look of contempt. We're all Christians here, he said, and took his long swig of his beer. What religion are you? Where'd you get the beer, I asked. You've been asked a question, he said, and pushed his glasses up the bridge of his nose with the back of his beer hand. I'm a product of the age of reason, I said. Where's the food? <laughs> he shook his head as if in disgust and pointed behind me. I turned around, the crowd parted, and there was a long table with bowls and plastic cups and a crystal punch bowl half filled with a yellow liquid. As I walked away from him, I heard Dornsbury hurl the insult clown at me. Any other time, I might have pounded his face in, but instead, I just laughed it off. The food table in the state I found it held a bowl with three pretzels in it and five other bowls of a tan dip that had crusted dark brown at the edges. A live fly buzzed in the middle of one bowl, unable to free itself. <laughs> That'll be a fossil someday, said a voice behind me. I turned to see a thin man in a black tuxedo. He had a wave of slick dark hair in front, big clunky black framed glasses, and a thinly trimmed mustache. Pretty appetizing, huh, I said to him. Allow me to introduce myself, he said. I'm the smartest man in the world. I shook his hand and told him my name. If you're the smartest man in the world, I said, how'd you wind up here? He gave a wry smile and told me, I only answer questions for money. I felt in my pants pocket for a crumpled bill. Taking it out and flattening it for him, I said, five bucks if you could tell me where I can get a beer. <laughs> five won't do it, he said. Now we had on a top hat and cape and looked like Mandrake the Magician with glasses. But five will get you half an answer. I handed him the bill, I'll take it, I said. You've got to go through the kitchen that way, he said and pointed. Once you're there, go out the side door onto the patio. That's all I can afford to tell you. <laughs> a steep price for some pretty thin shit, I said to him, and couldn't believe I was getting belligerent with the smartest man in the world. There was something exhilarating about it. When your wife asks a question, lady, he said, after I answer it, I'm going to kiss her and slip her the tongue so deeply I'll taste her panties. She'll see God, my friend. He tipped back his top hat and laughed arrogantly. I picked up a crusted bowl of dip. Touch my wife and you'll be the deadest man in the world, I said. <laughs> then I threw the bowl at him. He ducked at the last second. The bowl flew into the face of a heavy-set older woman in a sequin gown behind him. Tan goo dripped from her jowls and the bowl hit the wooden floor and shattered. For a moment I wondered where the carpet had gone. The woman I hit had been standing with an aged gentleman wearing a military uniform, sporting a ridiculously thick mutton chop sideburns. Preposterous, he shouted, and his monocle fell from his eye. He reached for the sword he had in his scabbard at his side. Meanwhile, the smartest man in the world had lived up to his name for once, and it split. I didn't see him anywhere. I followed his lead and merged into the crowd, moving fast, sweating profusely. In the kitchen, there was a fire eater. He was performing in the corner by the range. People had gathered around to watch, and it was impossible to get through to the patio door, which I could glimpse occasionally between heads in the crowd. I had to wait for him to finish his act and hope the log jam broke up. I watched him. He had two little torches that he held with the middle finger of his right hand. He'd pour a lighter fluid on them and then turn, turn on the range and light them off the burner. He had a small blonde ponytail and a beat up face, broken nose, scar tissue around the eyes. He was a lackluster showman. His approach was to say, 
I'm going to eat fire now, in a low, placid voice. <laughs> and then he ate it. <laughs> After you've seen someone eat fire once, there's not much else to it. I watched him eat fire five times, and by the fourth time, even though nobody left, nobody was clapping either. I had cold beer on my mind, so after the fifth time, I said in a loud voice, all right, let's get on with it. To my surprise, people started leaving the kitchen. The fire eater tried to see who'd said it, but I kept my gaze down and pushed gently forward. I found the cooler of beer out on the patio. It was filled with ice and rolling rock. I took one and sat down at the glass top table on a rock wrought iron chair with arms my ass, fat ass barely fit between. I was alone out there in the dark. The night was cool but pleasant and I could feel the sweat drying. Someone had left behind a pack of cigarettes. Lucky strikes, I didn't know they still made them, and a lighter. That beer tasted like heaven and the cig wasn't far behind. I took out my cell phone and dialed Lynn. It rang and rang and then she answered, where are you, she said. I told her I'm out on the patio having a beer. The show's gonna start any minute, she said. I got us a table. You can't believe how big the place is, I said. How many people are here? It took me forever to get to the food table. Bring me a beer, she said. Will do. And listen, if I don't get back in time and the smartest man in the world answers your question, don't let him touch you. There was silence from the other end of the line. I said her name a couple of times, but it was clear we'd either been cut off where she thought we were through and hung up. I put the cigarettes and lighter in one jacket pocket and then took another beer, put that in my other jacket pocket. I put my smoke out in the planter at the edge of the patio and then turned to head back in. As I moved toward the house, I saw the smartest man in the world's face at the window of the back door. He smiled at me and waved before looking down, as if he was going to open it and come out. An instant later, he was gone. I tried the doorknob and realized what he'd done was lock it. When I knocked on the door, I looked inside and saw the kitchen was completely empty. I heard a window opening above me on the second floor. I backed onto the patio and looked up. The smartest man in the world poked his head out. He was again wearing his top hat. Perhaps like in Miller's, uh, Chaucer's Miller's Tale, you can climb up here and kiss my hairy ass, he said. <laughs> Let me in, I said. There's a reason they call me the smartest man in the world, he said. The show starts in ten minutes. I'm going to call the cops, I told him. Dawnsbury says you're a pussy, said the smartest man. I'll kill you both, I shouted. No, you won't. Now hurry around front and pay again to be let in. You might catch me answering your wife's question. I heard Dawnsbury's laughter in the background. The window shut with a bang. I took out my cell phone, but when I flipped it open, it was dead, shit, I said, and headed for the edge of the patio. Only then did I notice that the side of the house butted up against the edge of a forest. In the moonlight, I could make out tall pine trees in both directions. There was a path that went either around the back of the place through the trees, or one that looked like it led to the front of the house. I was just about to head for the front when I realized that was the smartest man's advice. What were the chances he was going to tell me the best way to go? I stepped onto the path and headed toward the back. There were stretches of perfect night where the pines blocked the moon completely. I walked fast for a ways, but was soon out of breath and my Achilles tendon was aching, so I slowed down. Just then I noticed something on the side of the path, like a lectern. I stepped over to it. It was chest high, a, a chest high stand with a plaque on top, situated at an angle. There was something written on it. I took out the lighter, flicked it, and quickly read the plaque. It said, beware of owls. Mullions is not responsible for any damages or deaths caused by owls. I flicked the lighter again and this time noticed that beneath the writing there was an etching of a large owl in mid-flight grasping in its talons the severed head of Jenny, the Mullions hostess. Killer owls, I said aloud. A stiff breeze blew the flame out and felt more like autumn than spring. I noticed the path was strewn with fallen leaves. That's ridiculous, I said. Started walking again. Two minutes later, I wrapped my hand around the neck of the beer bottle in my pocket and took it out to use as a club. <laughs> Fuck those owls, I told myself. <laughs> I have to get back to Lynn. I put on as much steam as I could manage, and with almost every step, the tendon in my left heel got worse. She'll never let him touch her, I said to myself. If he tries, she'll punch him in the face and break his glasses. I hobbled a few more yards and then thought, or oh, will she? That's when I happened to look up and notice the pairs of yellow eyes trimming the trees like dull Christmas lights. They were everywhere. My knees went weak and my heart began to pound so hard I could hear it in my right ear. I desperately wanted to run but knew I wouldn't get far. Instead I crept forward, trembling, praying they hadn't noticed me and wouldn't. In whispers like a novena, I recited the theme song to the afternoon television cartoon of my youth, Tobor the Eighth Man. I got only as far as the FBI is helpless, it's 40 stories tall, when a shrill screech tore through the night. 
and Al's flight is silent, but I heard the beating of their wings in my mind as they swooped after me, 